Hey, we're glad you're here today, and we, we want to honor our fathers. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, uh, all of us guys have this seed within us that is that, that craves uh, adventure and achievement and challenge. And, and women have this as well, but sometimes I feel like our culture pushes that down in men. And, and when I talk about women having that as well, if you look at the bikes on stage, one of these bikes actually belongs to a woman. I mean, she likes that adventure and that challenge and all that too. And, and that's cool. But today I want to talk about guys. And, and for you ladies, I hope you'll listen to this. For you girls who are looking for a guy, hopefully you'll find something in this that you can use that will help you along. When I first uh, uh, told people that I had a motorcycle, I went into my office one day and there was a comic strip laying on my desk and it was uh, the comic strip Pickles by Brian Crane. And here was the strip. It says, today's the kind of day when I feel like just hopping on my Harley and taking off down the road. If my wife would let me. And I had a Harley. And my hemorrhoids weren't killing me. Yeah, see, born to be wild and being wild as we get older changes. For me, being wild is drinking coffee after three in the afternoon. But for some of you guys, it may be a little bit different. But really, seriously, within every guy, God has planted this, this seed of achievement and adventure and challenge. And that all can be met in the kingdom of God. You know, I, it, it troubles me to see the feminization of the church today and how that many men in our country see being a Christian is something that is uh, uh, not masculine and it's not manly. And, and I contend that the truth is, is that nothing could be further from the truth. But I do understand how they feel because somehow, some way, the church has become uh, something different than what God intended for it to be. And, and a lot of guys can feel a lot like the prodigal brother. You remember the story of the prodigal son and how the prodigal son uh, wasted all his money. He came home and they threw a party for him and the brother comes to the house and he speaks to the dad and he says, dad, I've been here and I've slaved away all this time and you didn't give me a party. And sometimes guys feel that way in the kingdom of God. They feel like, you know, the kingdom of God, even though it's supposed to be something that's turned into something else, it's turned into something that is, is slaving and it's turned into something that's partyless. And that's why five in six men in America will tell you that they're a Christian, yet only two in six men on any given Sunday will actually be in a worship service. See, being a man is not about what we've given up, it's about what we gain. And, and that's my first point this morning. The church has historically lost our men because we spend more time talking about what we've given up rather than what we have gained. It blows me away that a revolution, listen to that word, a revolution that was started by a carpenter and 12 men has turned into something in so many cases that is anything but a revolution and can be considered maybe even downright wimpy. That's not what the church is supposed to be. God made men with a seed he plants in our hearts. And women have this too, but, but men, we are men who need adventure, we need achievement, we need challenge. And it's been that way since the beginning. When God created man in Genesis chapter 1, we look in, in verse 28, it says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over all the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, I don't know if you see what I see in that verse of scripture but if you're a guy and you're reading this, this is what it says. Being in community with God includes hunting and fishing, right? It includes challenges and in conquering. It includes being fruitful and multiplying. Y'all know what that means. That's heaven on earth. That's what being a man is about. We are to be people who from the very beginning have been a part of adventure and achievement and challenge. Yet, Henry David Thoreau wrote these words, the mass of men leave lives of quiet desperation. And from my favorite movie, Braveheart, all men die, but few men ever really live. I want to contend to you today that the kingdom of God, the church, your families, your friends, they need you to stand up and be a wild man. They need to, you to stand up and be a Christian, 
man who was born for challenge, was born for adventure, and was born for achievement. So how do we do this? What, what do we do? You know, and every year, this time of year, I talk about what it means to be a man. And I'm not trying to cut women out. Please know more letters about being a misogynist and all that other stuff. But until this time next year, there's a verse of Scripture I'd like for all men to maybe dog ear in your Bibles and underline and think about. And it's, it, it was written to the church at Corinth as, as Paul was ending his letter. He wrote some things specifically for the guys. And here's what he said in verses 13 and 14. He said, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. I'll read it again. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. So, from that verse of Scripture this morning, I want to talk about what it means to be a Christian wild man, born to be wild, to, to meet the challenge that God has placed in the heart of man. And I'm going to give you four things to think about. I hope you'll take them home, think through them, see what you come up with. First one is that we need to be alert and stand guard at all times. When I think about being alert, I think about a friend of mine. He's, he's in our small group here at church, uh, my family's small group. Uh, he is an agent in the United States Secret Service. Uh, he's guarded several of our presidents. Uh, he told me after first service that he, this week he was guarding the president's grandchildren, which I'm sure is an adventure in itself. But you haven't lived till you've gone somewhere with him. He's not very big, and, and uh, actually neither is dynamite, but he's not very big. And, and our, our friends, we, we all call him our micro ninja. Because every time you go, with, go somewhere with him and you watch him, he's always on the perimeter. And he's always watching everything else that's going on. If there's someone in the crowd that has a concealed weapon, he knows it. And even when my son had gone overseas to spend a, a few months in London, he wouldn't talk to Melissa and I because he knew things that were going on in London that we wouldn't want to know. It would probably scare us to death. You're talking about being hyper aware? You're talking about being on the alert? When I think about that, I think about the micro ninja. And, and, and you know, the interesting thing is that we as, as guys, we need to be hyper aware. We need to be hyper aware for our families. We need to be hyper aware for people we care about. We need to, to be incredibly conscious of what's going on around us. And there's a reason why. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it tells us that be of sober spirit and be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Are you a perimeter husband? Are you a perimeter dad? Are you a perimeter friend? To where you're constantly on the alert? Or are you constantly on the alert about your relationship with your wife? Or are you constantly on the alert about your children and their relationships and their relationship with you and what's going on in their life? Are you constantly aware and, and alert about your family? I mean, the media that comes into our homes, and we, we watch things on TV, we never invite those people in our homes to do. And we hear things on the radio that we would never invite people in our homes to say. Are you constantly vigilant because we live in a society that has dulled our senses to these things and God is saying, you want to be a real man. You want to be a godly man. You want to be a wild man. The way that do, to do that is to stand up and be alert of what's going on around you. God made us to be this way in order to stand watch. The second thing is that we want you to be courageous. That God wants us to be courageous and to stand firm in the faith. And before I go any further, I want to let you know this. In order to stand for your faith does not mean that you have to give up your man card. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. To be able to stand up for your faith means that you have to be someone who has real courage within you. And it is so easy in our culture to be a victim. It, it is so easy in our culture to be a victim of our bad habits. It's easy in our culture to be a victim of, of a tough marriage. It's, it's easy in our culture to be a, a victim of a difficult job. It's easy in our culture to be a victim of a midlife crisis. 
But, but what happens when we meet these things is that God expects us to stand up with courage. And when Satan hits us with his best shot, he expects, and let me say this again, he expects, underline, guys, for us to swing back. He expects us to stand for what is important in our lives because the same power that Jesus had on this earth, that the Spirit of God working in him works in every man, woman, and child who's a Christian. He expects us to be courageous and to stand for the things in this world that matter because it's right. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, and put on the whole armor, or the full armor of God, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For, for our trust struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the forces of this, of, of this darkness, against spiritual forces and wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. God, we're at war, so that you will be able to resist the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm. Guys, we have to be courageous. We have to be people who are ready to stand for our faith. We have to stop thinking of God as a Santa Claus and think of God as a warrior. That's how he's described in Exodus 15.3. That if we're made in his image, that he has this, this fire in his heart just as well. And I also want to throw this in for free because I was wondering by my notes and actually caught some out of the corner of my eye. God never retreated. God never backed down when things were important. And he doesn't work through men that do that. We have to be people who have the strength and the courage to go full steam ahead in the things in life that really, really matter. Third thing. Be strong. Rely on the supernatural power that is within all of us. And guys, we all have that supernatural power. I don't know what you think about when you think about Jesus. A lot of people today will, will paint Jesus as this effeminate hippie. That he was just this cool guy that went around telling people that, you know what, you really ought to just love each other. And yeah, that's part of, of who he is. That he was a, a very loving God. But when I think of him, I, a great example is, I don't know if you've ever read the book Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. In the book Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis depicts Jesus as this lion named Aslan. And for many, many years, actually in his entire life, he never allowed anyone to make a movie of this book because he didn't feel like they could portray Aslan accurately as this fierce warrior of a lion but if you want a look into the heart of Jesus and what it means to be like him as a man in his strength there's a passage in there where the little girl Lucy sees Aslan for the first time and she asks the question is he safe and the response was no but he's good. And you know, men who are wild at heart, men who are, are born to be wild, are we always safe? No, but we're always good. You know, Jesus was loving. He loved children, put them on his lap, and, and invited people, and, and actually showed people that a part of them was to be like these children. Did, was, he, was he compassionate? Oh, yes, he healed people who were sick. And, and he cared for women in, in the culture that were outcasts in society. But when he was forced and when God was challenged before him, Jesus was fierce. Men, when our faith is being challenged, we must be fierce. I mean, let's look at what Jesus did in, in John chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. And he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers and he seated at their tables and he made a scourge out of cords, a whip, so to speak, and drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen. He poured all the coins and the money changers uh, and overturned their tables. When, when the very crux of what was supposed to be holy was turned into a marketplace, 
He turned it upside down. He was fierce. When he was challenged, because he, he challenged those around him to step up and be what God called him to be. In Luke chapter 11, verse 45 and 46, one of the lawyers said to him, Teacher, when you say, uh, you, when you say this, you insult us too. But he said, Woe to you, lawyers, as well, for you weigh down men with burdens hard to bear, while you yourselves will not even touch the burdens with one of your fingers. When he saw hypocrisy, when he was challenged because of his purity by those who were hypocrites, he stuck his finger in their chest. Why? Because Jesus, although he was loving and although he was compassionate and although he was good, he was also fierce when the time called for it. And men, we must be people who are fierce. The power that Jesus had is the same power that's found within us. He wasn't about being liked. He was about honoring God. Philip Yancey once wrote these words, how would telling people to be nice to one another get a man crucified? What government would execute Captain Kangaroo? Well, Jesus was more than that. Jesus challenged people. He was strong on a supernatural level. Well, guys, so far we've talked about, you know, we need to be alert and we need to be courageous and we need to be strong. This last one's a biggie. We need to love like a man. Put that on the back of your mind. Love like a man, even if you don't feel like it. Now, it's Father's Day. And guys, I, here's the reality. I didn't say this in early service, but I want, you know, I'll say this, this one because I'm running ahead of schedule, which is unprecedented. You know, they spend four times as much money on Mother's Day children do as they do on Father's Day. And I just want to say on behalf of all fathers, to all children and all moms, we love our kids just as much as your moms do. We just do it differently. We love like guys. You know, we love taking our children for walks. We love sharing a meal with them. We love teaching them to cook. We, we love teaching them to ride a bike. We like going to the zoo. And this is my favorite one. We love to play dress up with our kids. We love our kids. We just do it differently. We do it like guys do it. And there's nothing wrong with There's no shame in that game. And I know that today could be mistaken as some big macho fest, but, but what I'm trying to tell you is that we need godly men who are aware, who are courageous, who are strong, and are people who love the way Jesus loved. If you're a man who craves achievement, if you're a man who craves adventure, if you're a man who craves challenge, you want to do something tough, love people the way Paul described it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7, he says, Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. It does not brag, and is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, means it doesn't seek its own way. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoice with truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. And look at that last part. It endures all things. And I want to challenge you to mark this in your scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And I want to challenge you to look in there and find me anything in there that's romantic. Find me anything in that passage that talks about romance and that ooey-gooey feeling that we talk about being love in our culture. What that talks about is the practical concept of choosing to love people even when it's hard and even when you don't feel like it. You know, Carl Sandburg once wrote of Abraham Lincoln and he called him Velvet Steel. 
And I can't think of a better description for a Christian wild man than that. Velvet steel. Guys who love, but they love like a man. They love in ways that really, really matter. I mean, you think about those scriptures. You love your wife that way? You love your kids that way? Do you love your friends that way? That's a challenge. And I also want to say that, that wild men don't just love when it's difficult. Men who are wild at heart love because it's difficult. That's what it means to love like a man. The last thing I want to say is I close my lesson. There are no, particip- no participation trophies for Christian manhood. And some of you may know what I'm talking about. Some of you may not. Growing up, I played a lot of sports. I played football from the time I was 7 till I was 21. And I can remember several of those years, I'd get to the end of the season, and I would get a, a little trophy, or maybe it was a little sheet of paper that said basically that I had participated. I didn't do anything. I didn't win anything. All I did was endure to the end. And a lot of people think that everybody that does something should get a trophy. And I'm, I'm not one of those people because I, I think that if we're people of achievement and adventure and challenge, we want to accomplish something. And when it comes to being a Christian man, there is no participation trophy for that. Either you honor God by the way that you're aware and you honor God by the way you're strong and courageous or you honor God by the way that you love like a man or you don't. Either God looks on our lives as men that we are people who have given our dead level best or we're not and there is no in between. There are no participation trophies for being a Christian man. Guys, we're at war and the kingdom of God needs men to do this. It shocks me how in the church today there are so few men who are willing to step up and lead at even the lowest levels of leadership. It, 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 it frightens me for the future of the church. There are no participation trophies for being a Christian man. When I think of manhood and, and this kind of lesson about that seed that was put in us for adventure and for achievement and for challenge. I think about what I call, and it's been called before, the Heroes Hall of Fame in, in Hebrews chapter 11. I want to read part of it to you, verse 32 through 34, and then verse 38 says, And what more shall I say, for, for time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith, look what they did, conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war and put foreign armies to flight. And look at this last part from verse 38. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Where did these guys go? Where did men like that go? Who who go into the kingdom of God and see it as something that is important. See, saving and and reaching people is something that's, that's incredibly important. Where are those people today? In 1913, Ernest Shackelford was putting together a team to go and, and to discover the North Pole. He needed 26 men, and he was having trouble fielding this team, and so he put an article or an ad in the newspaper, several newspapers throughout the country. This is what the ad said, and it reminds me of Christian manhood. Men wanted for a hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, and constant danger. Safe return is doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. He put this ad in papers all across the country. I don't know how many cities and how many states, but I do know this. He needed 26 men to field this team. He got 5,000 replies. Why? Because within the heart of every man, 
is a seed that craves adventure and achievement and challenge. Guys, how will you be remembered? When your body starts and your eternity begins, what will people say about you? Will they all gather together and talk about your bowling average? I once saw a tombstone that had a bowling ball sitting on top of it and it said 289 average. They were liars in death, just like in life. <laughs> I've seen tombstones that said, See, I told you I was sick. And what will your say? Will your epitaph be about your power? Will it be about your strength? Will it be about your wealth? Maybe somebody will say something about your popularity or your, your fame. You see, it's my greatest desire that when your body stops and your soul moves on to its new life, that those people who are left behind will say this of you. This was a man, real man, of whom this world was not worthy. May they say that of you. And may your quest to be that guy start today. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the men who are here. I thank you for those who have helped make them what they are. Here's what I know above everything else. That they could have been anywhere they wanted to be. They could have asked their families to have done anything that they wanted to do and they chose to be here. And so, Father, I pray you bless them. Bless them to be men of courage, awareness, strength, and that they'll love the way your son loved. Bless them to be men of whom the world is not worthy. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And amen.